There we go. Adam Hatton, thank you for teaching me that poking out your tongue trick so the camera focuses thing. Works, really works. Hello and welcome to my kitchen. This is the part of the house that is most complete. In the world of theatre, things don't often go right. And I am one of those people who lives for things going wrong. When things go wrong on stage, I love it. It's my favourite thing. Because when you're in a contract that's a year long, and you're doing the same thing every night. I like to find my groove and then I kind of stay in my groove. And life as a performer becomes quite repetitive. You're singing the same songs every night, you're saying the same lines, you're working with the same people. It's always really interesting when a cover goes on because they'll always play it differently because they'll have their own take on a character. So that's always really exciting when you get someone new to play with on stage. But every now and again, something goes wrong. And I love it. It's my favourite. And with the nature of live theatre, things often go wrong. Most of the time you wouldn't know about it. Most of the time the audience wouldn't have a clue that something is slightly awry from our usual routine. But we know. So I'm gonna let you in on a few of the times when things have gone wrong on stage for me. I've got a story for each role that I've played. Maybe you were in the audience that night. Who knows? Number one is Eponine. And I'm really hoping my friend Matthew Hoy doesn't get cross at me for telling this story. I don't think he will. The old version of Les Mis used to have a revolving stage. There was someone sat on stage right every night who had to like turn a key and press a button and manually turn the revolve and line it up with these little glow-in-the-dark stickers that were on the stage every night. It was such a hard task. I my eyesight, I could never see those stickers. So I was always sort of in awe of whoever was working the Revolve that night. And Matt Hoy was new to the Queen's Theatre and he'd been working there for a few weeks and it was his turn to work the Revolve and it was his first night on Revolve duty. So we're in the beginning of Act Two and I deliver the letter to Valjean. This was when I was playing Eponine. I deliver the letter to Valjean that Marius has written for Cosette. He sings, go careful now, stay out of sight. There's danger in the streets tonight. And then he closes the gate and I would go to the back of the stage. He'd be at the front of the stage reading the letter and then the music would change into the beginning of On My Own. So say you're the audience and I'm at the back of the stage here and, and this is the revolve. The revolve would move against me, like towards me. So I would walk against it and like fight the revolve coming underneath my feet, but it didn't. <laughs> On this particular night, it started moving away from me. So I started walking with it and was moving really fast. And I was like, I have a, a mark to hit for the spotlights and all the lighting to work. So if I keep walking with the revolve moving with me, I'm just gonna end up back where I began at the back of the stage. So I started walking and I was like, nope, and just turned around and started walking the wrong way. And my favourite thing about when things go wrong is that you can hear everyone notice that something has gone wrong. All of a sudden there was like 10 people in the wings all going, it's going the wrong way, it's going the wrong way. Everyone panicking and everyone rushed around the, the revolve desk and they're all pressing buttons and they're all trying to make it stop. And luckily it stops for me to sing and now I'm all alone again, nowhere to turn, no one to go to. And I've got a good, like, three lines. Without a home, without a friend, without a place to say hello to. And now the night is near, now I can make believe he's here. And on the word here, it would start moving again. And luckily, it started moving the right way. And I just remember my heart going, oh my god, how do I fix it? How do I fix this? What do I do? What do I do? And in the moment, my head went, just walk backwards, just go the other way. Just walk towards the back of the stage, away from the audience. And bless him, Matthew Hoy, who was working the Revolve that night, bought me a box of chocolates to say sorry. But little did he know, he gave me one of my favorite theater stories ever. So thanks, Matt. Number two was when I was playing Truly Scrumptious on the UK tour of Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. This was quite a tech heavy show. When you've got a piece of set that is a car that's meant to float and fly. A lot of that was controlled by me and Lee Mead. Lee Mead who was playing Caractacus Potts. Um, there were lots of buttons to push in the car that we had to control and discreetly pull for the wings to come, the doors to come open first and then the wings to come out and for the doors to open, different doors to open and then the flotation device to inflate under the car. 
There was lots to think about when we were sat in that car. But there was one thing every night that I never had to worry about, and that was my motorbike. Truly Scrumptious rode a motorbike in this version of the show, which I loved. I thought it was brilliant. I had the best time on this motorbike. And it was a really old fashioned motorbike, a real one that had been renovated to be part of the show. So it was just on a track. Someone would just press a button and I would sit on the bike and it would just whiz across the stage. And then when it got to the other side, it would be taken off of its track, turned around and would go back the other way. And this was something I didn't control. Someone else in the wings just had to push a button and I would move back and forth. And it always worked. It always went really smoothly. And I never worried about it. There was this one, <laughs> this one show where the scene in which I was on this motorbike just went as wrong as it could have gone. Everyone forgot their lines and the scene ended up being about five minutes shorter than it usually is. So the person in the wings opposite me, who's waiting to press the button, wasn't ready because they hadn't heard the cue line. Because no one had said it because someone had forgotten it. <laughs> so I got on the bike and my final line was, good day, sir. But I was saying it like five, four or five minutes too early. So I just went, good day, sir, put on my goggles and pretended to, you know, that was the motion that I was told would work the bike. So I did that and nothing happened and I just stayed still. And I was like, oh God. So I just did a bit of like, <sighs> sort of acting like, oh, this blasted bike. Oh, I don't like this bike, sort of acting. Did it again. Nothing, and I just looked into the wings at Ollie, Ollie Ellerton, not my Ollie, Ollie Ellerton, who was the guy who was meant to press the button, and I just looked at him, and I remember him sort of chatting with someone, and he looked at me and went, <gasps> and just did that and panicked, and was like, put his headphones back on, and was pressing the button, and finally it started working. But it was that moment where I was like, am I just gonna have to abandon the motorbike on stage and just walk off in a huff? <laughs> Is that what's gonna have to happen here? And luckily, just as I was about to plan B and get off the bike, it started moving. Oh, gives me the sweats thinking about it. Number three was when I was in the Adams Family playing Wednesday Adams. Act two was very prop heavy for me. I had a scarf, a necklace with an engagement ring on it, a backpack, a doll in the backpack. There was sort of a, a quiver on the, the backpack that had one singular arrow in it and a crossbow. It was a lot to think about, and it was a lot to remember to put on at the beginning of Act Two. And there was this one day where I was really ill. I had some kind of stomach bug before the show. And there's sort of a cut off point where you can say, I'm not well and I can't do the show. And it's usually around 4.30 before an evening performance. Didn't realize how ill I was until the half hour call, which is half an hour, 35 minutes before the show begins. And I, was sick, but I threw up before the show. And I was like, well, I can't go off now because it's not giving the understudy enough time to get ready. And this would have been the first time that she'd have gone on in the tour. So it would have been really throwing her in the deep end and throwing her on. So I was like, no, I'm, I've been sick now. I feel better. I feel better than I did. I'm okay. I'm gonna do it. Got through the first half and I was all right, but I was just feeling really sort of drained and really tired. And I was in the opening scene of act two and I got through that and then I had about 10 minutes to sit down in my dressing room and sort of compose myself. And usually I would leave the backpack on because I was always scared that I was gonna forget it. But on this particular day, I just wasn't feeling myself and I took the backpack off and I laid down. So when I got back up to go to the stage, I forgot to put it back on. And it was only until about 10 seconds before I was about to walk on stage I was like, I don't have my backpack. And I just turned to the nearest crew member and was like, I don't have my backpack. I need the backpack for the next scene. Please, can you tell someone it's in, it's in my dressing room? It's on the sofa in my dressing room. Please, can you tell someone? And then just walked on stage. But at the end of the scene that I was walking on for, I had to get the doll out of the backpack and I didn't have it and the arrow I would need for the scene after that. And I didn't leave the stage before I needed all these props. There was no way for me to get them. So halfway through this next scene, which was a solo song that Gomez would sing, bless her, one of our team, Katie, just appeared in the wing next to me. And luckily I was really close to the edge of the stage, sat on a big tomb. <laughs> 
and she just appeared with it and I was like, I saw it and I just really slowly, because everyone's focusing on Gomez over the other side of the stage singing his song, just really carefully just reached and just discreetly put it on. <laughs> no, no one noticed. It was eggy. The definition of eggy. Awful. Never happened again though. Number four was in Heathers. Luckily, nothing really went that wrong in Heathers. Something I will tell you about Heathers though, I had maybe one of the most terrifying performances of my career in Heathers. We were seven weeks in to our eight week run of The Other Palace and I'm pulled to one side on the Monday of our seventh week. I'm told that a new song has been written for me. And I'm like, amazing. I've never had a song written for me before in a musical, that's epic. And they're like, yeah, it's, um, it's going into the show on Friday. And I just remember sort of <laughs> that echoing in my ears, Friday, Friday, Friday. And I was like, right. And basically, they sent it to me on the Monday. They'd recorded a demo in California. So they sent me this demo and the lyrics and I had to learn this song. We rehearsed it on the Thursday and it went into the show on the Friday. And I've never been so terrified in my life because the fans of Heathers are hardcore and they know all the songs, they know all the lines, they know all the characters, they know the beats of the show, they know what happens where. So the fact that I was debuting this new song at a really crucial point in Veronica Sawyer's story, it, it was amazing and so exciting, but I was just so nervous because I know how huge the reaction was going to be. And the song before I Say No is Lifeboat, which is a song that one of the Heather sings, Heather McNamara, who was played by Sophie Isaacs, and I'm in the background, and usually I'd be linked arms with JD, Jamie Moscato, and we'd be stood in the background like, oh, isn't this sad? Isn't this a really sad moment for Matt Namara? And I was just concentrating. I was just going through the lyrics in my head. I was just thinking about the next 10 minutes of my life. And I just remember Jamie whispering in my ear, saying, I've not heard you breathe in a really long time. You need to calm down. But it's funny how the most pressureful moments often result in the most wonderful moments. No pressure, no diamonds. And that was one of those moments for me. Number five was when I was playing Beth for the second time in The War of the Worlds, uh, which was the end of 2018, shortly after I left Heathers. Immediately after I left Heathers, I ended Heathers on the 24th and I started Tech on the 25th. I think it was our second to last performance of The War of the Worlds. And I had this really elaborate blue costume that was made up of several different parts. But the skirt was just simply poppers and a hook down the back. And when the corset went on and sucked my waist in, say this is like the, the hook of the skirt, when it cinched my waist in, it sort of like undid the hook. There's this moment where we're on the floor together. And as we went to stand up, Jason Donovan, who was playing my husband, stood on the front of my skirt. And I just heard all of the poppers go, I was like, ah, this could be a problem. <laughs> and as I stood up, my skirt did not. My skirt did not come with me. So I managed to sort of pull it up and deal with it for the next minute or so, because it's a very long number. It's like a 10 minute number. And there's a point where Jason would go out into the audience in this big instrumental and I've got in-ears in. And the reason you wear in-ears is um, because in arenas that are so, so huge, it helps you hear the music much better than if you didn't have them in because it would just, the music would echo and bounce off of all those really big walls. So we can hear the music much, much better. But also in this moment, it meant that I could be spoken to by the team backstage who luckily had seen what had happened. They could see on all of the monitors. And I just had someone in my ear during this big instrumental bit where Jason's gone out into the audience and I'm just supposed to be stood there like praying because I'm a Parsons wife. Carrie, can you come back up the ramp so we can fix your wardrobe malfunction? Thank you very much, see you in a second. And I was like, no worries. <laughs> I couldn't talk back, but I was like, yep, okay. And just very carefully walked, they very, serene and calm, just walked back up the ramp. And then I was like, oh my God, fix it, please fix it. Luckily, I was wearing a pair of bloomers, so it's fine. No one saw anything they shouldn't have seen, but good job I remembered to wear them that show, eh? And finally, was very recently in Les Mis again at the Sondheim Theatre whilst I was playing Fontaine. But this didn't happen when I was 
Fontaine. This happened when I was Patrice, the potato peeler on the barricades. For those of you that don't know, nearly everyone who plays a principal role in Les Mis, like Eponine, Cosette, Mr. T, Madame T, Fontaine, Andras, Marius, when they are not their principal role, they are in the ensemble. And I think I'm the only principal character who is their principal first and then goes into the ensemble. I think everyone else is the other way around. They're their ensemble track and then they go into their principal character because that's just the way that the timelines work out in Les Mis. So I am on the barricade as a barricade lady whom I have called Patrice for giggles. And I am in charge of feeding the barricade. I have a bucket of potatoes and during Little Fall of Rain I sit and peel those potatoes at the back of the stage. My potato peeling is actually very short lived. I don't do a huge amount of potato peeling. It's solely through Little Fall of Rain. And then I put the bucket onto the barricade and it stays there until I leave the stage after bringing him home and I take the bucket with me. So the bucket that I initially had that's filled with fake potatoes, they're not real. It was a proper old bucket. It wasn't a prop. It wasn't like, you know, made of plastic and painted to look old. It was a proper antique bucket. There's a reason I'm telling you this, I promise. So there's a bit where me and another barricade lady, Jessie Hart, we climb through the barricade. And as we both climb through the barricade, one of us knocks the bucket into the barricade with us. Cause the barricade is kind of like very intricate, full of holes and you can climb in and out of it. One of us knocks the bucket over into the barricade. And we're in pitch black at this point. And at the front of the stage are Valjean and Javert having their little second confrontation. It's all very tense. So we're trying to be as quiet as we can. And we're picking up these potatoes and putting them into the bucket. I suddenly realize as I try to pick up the bucket that the bottom of the bucket has fallen out into the bucket and split perfectly in two. So there is no saving this bucket. And there's about 30 potatoes, 30 to 40 potatoes. And they're all, they're very, very well done these potatoes, they're very realistic. There are some big, there's some really small that can get into really small places. Really good. So suddenly we have nowhere to put these potatoes because the bucket's broken. There's no bottom on the bucket. What do we do? Luckily, there are these ammunition boxes that are supposed to be full of bullets, but they're just empty and we just pretend to take the bullets out and hand them to people. But neither myself or Jesse can get to these ammunition boxes because they are the other side of this little barricade. We're in the barricade, they are outside the barricade. So we have to whisper to Emma, Emma Warren. Pfft, here's a potato, you put it in the bucket. I'm picking up potatoes and handing them to Jesse, and Jesse is handing them outside the barricade to Emma to put them into these ammunition boxes. And suddenly when the lights come up and we are revealed and we're about to go in to drink with me, I suddenly realise just how many potatoes there are. They're everywhere. They're everywhere. They are everywhere. And at this point, I'm the only one who stays with the potatoes. <laughs> Emma and Jessie have other stuff that they need to go and do. They've got props that they need to move, which is way more important than what I need to do. There's nothing that I need to do that really impacts anybody else. So during the entirety of Drink With Me, I am sat on my ass at the back, leaning backwards into the barricade, trying to grab as many potatoes as I can. <laughs> into my skirt which I've like rolled up and holding in my hand to create some kind of like kangaroo pouch to try and pick up all of these potatoes and put them into an ammunition box within the space of about two verses and a chorus. I've got a new bucket now, don't worry. I've got a new really sturdy bucket. Don't fret. I've got lots of stories about things that have gone wrong on stage but a lot of them didn't happen to me so I don't feel like it's fair for me to tell those stories because I was simply present for them. They didn't actually happen to me, but these ones did. So I hope you enjoy. Ah, oh, the magic of live theater. So if you ever go and see a show and something goes wrong, just know that you have just witnessed something that those actors will probably talk about and retell for the rest of their lives. It's a special moment. I love even being in the audience when things go wrong because I know just how special that moment is to all of those actors on stage who have suddenly gone like that, their ears are pricked up and they're like, oh, something's gone wrong. This is the best. So if anything else crops up, I will let you know. Thanks for listening, I will see you very soon.